we are live now so hello everyone i am dr rajat agrawal president assam in india and welcome to the second series of our master class series and today we are very excited because we have a very important topic the principles of depoverty correction we think actually this is one of the most important topics in any deformity correction so without wasting time i we are very lucky today to have world famous very renowned professor hemant sharma with us so he will be teaching us about the principles and his experiences so without wasting time i hand over to shamsul to uh, tell him a brief about him and then we'll be starting the topic shamsul you can take care thank you sir thank you everybody welcome everyone in today's assam india session of uh, webinar on deformity correction so today we have the second series of the master class session of kerala chapter on uh, the theme is principle deformity correction we have the main faculty is professor himan sharma from uk uh, dr prem vasudevan sir and we have three cases from uh, dr cheren gubur dr Shibujan Volkan and Dr. G J is our coordinator. So, about Dr. Himan Sharma. Professor Himan Sharma is, uh, has done past years sir, orthopedics and trauma, M S in orthopedics and trauma, M C H in orthopedics and trauma, F R C S London, F R C S Glasgow. He is honorary professor in trauma and orthopedics, Hull New York Medical University, University of Hull consultant orthopedic and trauma surgeon at Hull University Teaching Hospitals. He provides tertiary services with with the UK International for Bone Infections, Limb Lengthening, Non-Union Deformity Correction and Complex, and Reconstructive Trauma Lower Limb Surgeon. He is president of British uh, Limb Reconstruction Society (BLRS) uh, and uh, B is uh, British Orthopedic Association Research Committee member. He is chair of Limb Limb Reconstruction Committee International and uh, Society of Orthopedic Surgeons and Traumatologists (SICOD). Past treasurer of BLRS. He's done so many research works, like his active trials of uh, multicentric randomized control trial activity to investigate the clinical and cost-effectiveness of internal plate fixation versus external fixation uh, for the measurement of taxi pylon fractures, initial TPR. He has a prolific study on uh, the development of patient-related outcome measures, prongs for limb reconstruction. He has done a CARDS trial, a multicentric prospective knee orthotic activity, TKR versus destruction with external fixator. He has done a BWAS trial, BWAS dimension study for fracture healing. He has done a on STO theory of compensatory mechanisms, developing mathematical models to assess the compensatory effects of STO and uh, consequences on thermal imaging, like uh, use of thermal imaging to identify bone and joint infections. He has book chapters in so many books like uh, fundamentals of lower limb deformity analysis. And the chapter was uh, normal, limb, uh, normal lower limb geometry, and the same uh, book was as uh, the author was Professor, Professor Gavin and uh, Dr. Milan Chaudhary sir. He has chapter in Oxford textbook of fundamentals of surgeries. He has chapter in operative manual of proximal femoral structures. And he has so many publications. You cannot enumerate. It's more than forty. Let's see the long list is here. His editorial board. I'm a regular member of. Uh, the Journal of Limb Learning and Reconstruction, that is JLLR, and the Journal of Orthopedics, Review for Strategies in Limb Reconstruction and Trauma, Review for Journal of Periodic Orthopedics, and has reviewed research progress for funding for Fallon Foundation and other funding bodies, using such as program, and he has been a, uh, he's been visited different countries, like Malaysia, India, UK, Romania as faculty. So now I will come to Professor Hemant Sarva, sir. To start his lecture on principles of deformity correction, that is very very important. Yes, sir. I request everybody else to mute. Mm -hmm. Just one. Come, cut there. Just one second. Let me just go to that. Unmute, cut there. So, can everybody uh, hear me? And you can see the slides. Yeah, yes, great. Sir. So, no, thank you so much, and uh, it's my honor and privilege to be part of the Asami uh, India Teaching Program. And uh, Shamsul, thank you so much for a, a very detailed uh, introduction. 
and uh, thank you so much to Rajat and Executive Committee of the Assami India for giving me the honor to speak to uh, members of the Assami India. Um, I'm, I'm originally from Gwalior, which is out a lot of you probably not far off, and then not from, 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 from far from Jayant actually, if you're the same state, um, just a different college. Um, and uh, in, in the UK, I work in Hull, which is a city in North, which is um, at the coast. And uh, we have um, quite a big unit of limb reconstruction and bone infections, uh, which we provide a large area to cover and a large area uh, we, uh, we provide the service. Um, so my uh, hospital is basically quite large, it's a university hospital, we have got our own medical school and uh, maybe two major hospitals but with some smaller ones uh, in it. I think your thing is, uh, keep, yeah, and uh, uh, it's quite a big hospital, we, we provide pretty much everything under the roof uh, in terms of services, Al is famous for a number of things apart from this bridge, uh, which was the longest in the world at the time when it was built. But principally, I think is a William Wilberforce who worked very hard towards the abolition of slavery in his time when he was a member of parliament from my area mm -hmm. and due to his efforts and, and some others as well, that the slavery was abolished from Hull. He's probably the most famous son of Hull. Uh, Today, I hope that we can run through some of the basic principles uh, of the deformity analysis and we understand the uh, osteotomy rules and so we can be in a position to uh, utilize the principles in our day-to-day -day practice and to um, use it in a, uh, in a method of fixation, whichever one you want to do. And it does not necessarily has to be the frame it could be a plate or a nail or whatever you do, but is the principles which are uh, are critical into uh, for correcting the uh, the deformity. And I think this. So uh, for, uh, for for any deformity analysis. Uh, so, sorry, just one more thing. I'm going to just stick to the principles as I think Cherry and, and Vasu is going to present some amazing cases uh, as they always do. They have some, they have done some wonderful work. Uh, so I'm just going to lo uh, look at the principles and the clinical cases would be presented by Cherry and, and Vasu. So for anything, if you want to do a, a, an analysis, it is not just the importance of the uh, radiological measurements, but I think that a holistic approach to the uh, to the patient is, is very critical. So apart from a detailed history, uh, which is important, the examination is is very critical. And examination should extend from the spine to the pelvis and to the every joint of the lower limb, including the uh, including the hind foot. And we need to look at for not only on the deformities but also also for compensation. And also we need to be clearly identify whether the compensation is uh, fixed or it's mobile or it's partly fixed kind of. So it, it gives you an idea that it, it's quite important because if you correct a deformity and you do not address the compensation, then there's a possibility that we inadvertently can end up creating a secondary deformity, which patients may, patient may not like. Investigations are very rarely needed, and principally is, is X-ray based uh, um, planning, which is quite enough for uh, for almost all cases. Although occasionally we need some some further investigations. <clears throat> now, if you look at a a pen, and I think if you look at the pen, if you hang it in the air, it has got three axes, and it was it's got six degrees of freedom. And it's important that we need to look at our X-rays are two degrees, no, sorry, two dimensional. And we're trying to correct a three dimensional deformity. So if you look at it, it can go in either way, front and back and up and down. So three axes will give you X, Y, Z will give you six degrees of freedom. And that freedom is actually uh, what you need to look at when you uh, looking at, uh, at patient clinically. And because radiologically, it only gives you two dimensions and you need to correct the deformity in three dimensions. 
<coughs> so my name is Hemant Sharma. I work in Hull, which is, uh, uh, um, and uh, my principal job, uh, uh, my principal work is, uh, is limb reconstruction and deformity correction. So what I'm trying to do is we run a course which lasts for about three to four days uh, and we run the whole principle and this is what I'm trying to condense in about next 20 minutes or so. So therefore, it's, it, it, it is a bit challenging and what I'll do is I'll try my best to condense it and obviously we, we can have questions and I'll try to talk about the most relevant things which would be useful in a day-to-day -day practice. Now, the principles of the deformity planning were laid very well by Dror Paley in his book and a number of authors and, and, and Dror con condensed all the principles into his book, which is, uh, which is actually quite, uh, quite detailed. Uh, and, uh, uh, and we have subsequently published our book just uh, this year. And our book is available free of cost if anybody wants to download. And I, I like to pay a tribute to Michael Laverick, who's probably one of the grand masters and original persons in the UK who uh, led the, um, who, who was also trained by Drawer, but is, um, he's the first one to sort of implement the principles and the deformity planning in UK as a whole. Now, I, if you look at, the, look at the traditional methods, what we look at it is we look at an X-ray where I say, look, this X-ray and there's no, no deformity in femur and the deformity looks to be in the tibia. If you draw standard ways, we do the line in tibia that appears to be deformity, which is at the obvious apex of the deformity. And we can assume there's a uh, deformity in the shaft of this tibia. But there's a possibility that there might be deformity periarticular quite close to the joint, which we can easily miss because we are not, because it's not, it's not very obvious. And it, if you actually look at in this tibia, there's a very subtle deformity, uh, very subtle periarticular deformity. It may not be relevant to correct it, or may not, we may not need to correct it. But if we just use, you, you, you use the traditional methods, we end up missing this deformity. So, so let's look at things differently. We don't need to follow the usual re regime of drawing straightforward lines. So we look at things slightly differently then we make things easy for ourselves. So look at, look at some basics. A, a mechanical axis is a line which connects the two adjacent joints between the center of the one joint to the center of another joint. An atomical axis is the line which is, goes in the center of the bone. So your mechanical axis is always straight and anatomical axis may be straight, may not be straight. If you look at the femur, there's a difference in the anatomical and mechanical axis. It's about six to seven degrees between the two axes. And if you look at the tibia, for the practical purposes, the mechanical axis and anatomical axis is similar. And anatomical is slightly medial, but in for a day-to-day practice, it's, it's the single axis we can take. Now, before we plan any, anything, we need to have a way of taking x-rays consistently. And I think that everybody has a different way and all we need to be looking at is taking the X-ray perpendicular to the axis of motion. So if the patella is subluxed and there's a problem with the patellofemoral joint, then this method is not useful, in which case you need to do flexion extension of the knee and take the X-ray according to that. But in normally, in most of the day-to-day practice, in the routine practice, practice, if we can put the patella forward in the center of the X-ray and ignoring hip and knee, no, sorry, hip and hip and foot, then that will give you a consistent way of doing an X-rays, which uh, with the margin of error is quite small, and therefore uh, uh, less chances of, of us making mistakes. So this is an X-ray which you take in routinely, if you see this is the mechanical axis, it's a bit lateral. If you look at the patella, it's not center. Now, if you take the same X-ray with, with the patella center, suddenly you, you realize that your axis, uh, your deformity is much worse and, you may, and your mechanical axis is far uh, further lateral than it originally is. If you take the 
if you if you plan your deformity according to this X-ray, then you will be undercorrecting the undercorrecting the bone, and therefore you need to plan it according to how how it needs to be uh, correct the actual deformity, and that's how you get the uh, result which is um, which is best for the from the patient's perspective. Now, if you look at these angles, you all are aware of it, but I'll just go through it uh, quickly. There are two ways we can look at it, mechanical and anatomical axis planning. TBI it is the same, but in femur it is different. And I'm not going to emphasize on these angles, you all, as you said, you all are, are aware of it, but we need to keep in mind whenever we are planning, it's a very good guide for us to uh, plan a deformity and and analyze the deformity. In the sagittal plane, again, there are angles and there are landmarks which we can draw uh, to identify these angles and identify the deformity. Now, in terms of the terminology, there are a number of things, but I'll concentrate on three things. One is CORA, Center of Rotational Angulation. This is a term coined by the Japanese surgeon. And uh, it basically means the apex of the deformity where two lines meet. The second is ACA, which is where we actually correct a deformity. So if you look at the core or the apex of the, de of the deformity, it is a intersection of the two axes where they meet, that's CORA. And uh, it, is a, it is a geometrical point and we, mm, uh, it has, uh, a surgeon has no control over it. Now ACA is the point where we uh, is, where the actual uh, actual correction is done, and it doesn't it, it 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 can be the same level as the osteotomy. It can be different from the core or osteotomy. It's an independent point, and typically it is the place where we put our hinges. So so wherever we put our hinge, that's a core. Uh, the, uh, sorry, that's a echa. Uh, now, if you look at the core, we have no control over the core because it is the it is a geometrical fact. Where we, can, where, where we correct the deformity, that's up to us, and we have some control over it. In whichever way we want to control it, we want to replace our ACA, whether we want to have a translation or not. And osteotomy, again, we have some control over it, because quite often we like to move away the osteotomy from the uh, bad bone to good bone and good soft tissue. And it is the interaction and the relative position of these three things which will influence again and give us the final position of our bone segments. And I'll try to emphasize the, th 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 through these osteotomy rules, which will um, help to clarify the things further. So if you see the rule one, in rule one, your, co your cora, your echa, and your osteotomy at the same point. And therefore, both the proximal and distal uh, axis and the bone becomes collinear, and then there is no, no translation. This is an example of that. And the advantage is since there's no secondary deformity, you can use any implant to correct the deform to stabilize the bone after correcting the, uh, after correcting the deformity. And it's quite suitable for nailing uh, if, if that is what you want to do. Uh, you can use the rule one for that. Rule two, when echa is through the cora, so you're, you're, you, so you're correcting at the apex of the deformity, but osteotomy is a different level, and, and that could be of, of a number of reasons, in which case your bone will become collinear, but there's a slight zigzag deformity. And, and this is an example. This is a 17-year-old uh, young girl who had a, a reversal of a, a slope, and you'll find, <coughs> excuse me, and you see here, um, and, and uh, uh, clinically she has had, had hyperextension and couldn't do any sports. And here, if you plan it, your cora is, is very high. And if it's, in whatever method of fixation you do, you cannot stabilize the proximal segment. So you have to move your osteotomy down. And when you move the osteotomy down, because we are away from the cora, you end up with a translation. And which basically, it gives you a segment where you can put in a plate if you want, or you can put in a frame easily. So, the, so this is the um, this is quite useful in the periarticular de uh, deformities, 
And, and what happens is that when the segment is small, you can move the osteotomy away to give you a segment big enough to apply your uh, whichever fixation method you, you're trying to use. Now, it can be difficult for nails if you're doing a diaphysis, although nails can be done in the metaphysis. So your implant choice can be limited at times, and that needs to be kept into consideration. Now, osteotomy rule three is when your osteotomy and echa is away from the apex of the deformity, and which basically means you will end up with a, a secondary translation deformity. This is usually a complication. However, it can be used to advantage sometimes when there's a pre-existing translation, and therefore that can be corrected through it. But often it is a complication. Now, the Depending on where you put your ACA on your axis, that if you go proximal, then you have a translation in one direction. If you go distal, you have a translation in another direction. And it's basically the, the relationship of this to, your, uh, uh, to the point of correction, which is your ACA, is linear. And that's for the... So moving up and down gives you translation and moving sideways on the transverse bisector will give you uh, um, length on the convex side. If you put your um, ACA on the convex side, if you put your ACA on the concave side, it will shorten your leg. And again, this is quite relevant in terms of where you put your hinge in terms of your deformity correction and planning whether you want to gain length or not. And again, so, so this is your transverse bisector, which basically divides the deformity into two. And again, this is a longitudinal bisector. I wouldn't, I wouldn't dwell too much on that because you're all aware of it. I'll show you an example just to uh, emphasize the principle. And uh, so if, if you can all see this bone, now, if you see, so, 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 so this is my ACA. So if we say this is a transverse bisector, for example, if we put an ACA uh, at the convex side of the deformity and we correct it, we will gain length. If you go further away from the, uh, further away you go, the more is the length. And each time that's your hinge that gets your length. And similarly, if you put it on the concave side, it will shorten the, the bone. So, 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 so this you can be aware of it, uh, where to place it. If you put it uh, proximally on the, on the axis, it will principally translate with no length. And similarly, if you put it distally on the distal axis, it will translate it will translate in a in opposite direction, but with no length uh, or, or shortening of the bone. Now, quite often we have to put the combination of it and, and that will depend. It's quite easy to measure, as I said, it's a linear relationship. So depending on how much length you want to gain and how much translation you want to do, you can do an easily geometric calc a geometrical calculation to help it. So if you can put it here, this will give you some translation and some length. If you want to get more length and, uh, and translation, you can put it, again, you do a measurement and it'll give you both. So this can be easily done to, you know, to plan it out. And it's a very simple method. You need a pen and paper and you can easily plan it out and work it. If you have any, any sophisticated softwares, it can be done. Uh, it can be utilized in that as well. Now, what I'll do is I'll run through a few steps in uh, just to emphasize the uh, steps in planning, just to um, uh, so that uh, uh, it um, to keep things simple. And again, uh, when we are planning any any either mechanical or anatomical axis, we must stick to one axis. Because in TV, although it is the same, so it doesn't make a difference. And usually mechanical is easier because you can, you, you know, because uh, uh, periarticular deformities can be easily identified. In femur, it is very critical that we do not mix the two 
axis and whichever axis we plan either anatomical or mechanical we should stick to that otherwise we'll have disastrous results so step one is principally you draw a line from the center of the hip to the center of the ankle and uh, uh, it will pass somewhere in the medial side on the center and you may need to measure this distance and, and this is your mechanical axis deviation and up to 10 millimeters we considered is as normal. Then once you've done the mechanical axis deviation, uh, identify the uh, anatomical lateral distal femoral angle if you're doing anatomical axis in which in this case we are. So we'll only look for anatomical axis. We look at medial proximal tibial angle. And again, if you know this is the same for uh, tibia, uh, for the an, uh, um, anatomical and mechanical, so makes no difference. We look at the joint congruence angle and the line. Reason we need to look at it is: is there any deformity in the joint because of previous intraarticular fractures, some congenital deformities, or osteoarthritis? They all can cause intraarticular deformities. Then we then we measure the medial proximal uh, femoral angle. Then we go to the tibia, we do the distal tibia and we, and we measure a lateral distal tibial angle. If you're doing mechanical axis, the tibial angles is the same. The only difference is we need to do mechanical lateral distal femoral angle and lateral proximal femoral angle as compared to medial proximal, uh, as, as compared to medial angle in the femur. Now, normally, uh, in the femur, mechanical axis is very difficult and usually it's not usually what we use. And anatomical axis is usually we uh, we use in a day-to-day -day, uh, day -day practice. So I'm going to run through some steps how I do it. So you uh, mark center of the hip, center of the knee, center of the ankle, draw a line, measure your mechanical axis deviation, then you draw mid diaphyseal line in the femur and then and a line in the tibia. You measure the medial proximal tibial angle. I think somebody's mic is microphone is open. And then you measure uh, uh, anatomical lateral distal femoral angle, and we realize this is abnormal. Then we draw a distal. Uh, uh, lateral distal, distal femoral angle, and that would be you. You take it from other side. Firstly, if that is not normal, we use the population average, which is eighty-one degrees, and we identify the uh, apex of the deformity and we measure the deformity. In tibia, it is the same, but as I said earlier, we tend to use the mechanical axis because it's, because it is easier. The steps are again the similar. And you draw the center of the hip, center of the knee, center of the ankle. We draw an axis. Uh, we draw a line between hip, center of the hip and center of the ankle. Identify your me mechanical axis deviation. Then we draw mechanical axis, a lateral distal femoral angle. And we draw a medial proximal tibial angle. And here, clearly medial proximal tibial angle is abnormal. And a lateral distal femoral angle. Uh, so, since our lateral distal femoral angle is normal, all we can do is we can extend that line distally. Again, we can we have to use the average from other side if we have available. Otherwise, you can use the population average, or you can easily extend the line if the lateral distal femoral angle is normal. You draw a lateral distal femoral lateral distal tibial angle that is the dis, distal axis of the tibia. We identify the apex of the deformity. You measure the deformity and identify an angle. So just to re re revise, you first do a mechanical axis deviation. Then we measure lateral distal femoral angle, either mechanical or anatomical. We identify metal, medial proximal tibial angle. We identify joint line congruence angle. And we identify medial, uh, sorry, proximal femoral angle, either medial or lateral, depending on which axis you're using, mechanical or anatomical, and you measure lateral distal tibial angle. So this is an example. Again, we draw a mechanical axis first, 
Then anatomical axis we do is a lateral, lateral distal femoral angle is 75, which is clearly abnormal. We draw medial proximal tibial angle, which we find is also uh, abnormal. We draw lateral distal tibial angle uh, and uh, that uh, at 90 degrees, and we realize that the cora is outside the deform outside the bone, which means it has to be more than one deformity, and therefore we draw a third axis. And so there is a axis in the, the there's a multiple deformity in the tibia, and and this possibly and this is a deformity in the femur. So that way, if you if you if you follow the steps, then your chances of missing any deformity is fairly is uh, is minimal, or and we can identify all deformities. You may may not want to correct all the deformities, and therefore, the you may want to um, ignore some deformities if they are too small or they are not. Um, you can overcompensate by correction at other planes to reduce the number of osteotomies. That is a pragmatic planning which you need to look at, that will look at the patient and how you, um, what is best for the patient rather than looking for the real, for the radiological um, uh, alignment and good looking x-rays. You must always be planning a deform, uh, a corrections analysis and planning according to what patient is uh, needs rather than at the x-ray, uh, rather than trying to make the uh, x-rays look good. So to summarize, the, uh, your deformity can be an anatomical and mechanical axis. In femur, it's different. So you need to plan in one axis. In TBS, it is the same. Your deformity can be an oblique plane. And uh, again, we have, I haven't talked about it. It could be multi-apical, and it's important um, because I think we need to do more than one talks about it to look into all that in detail. All deformities will have a direction, will have a will have a magnitude, and it could be it they have a level, and it could be uniapical or could be multiapical, and and deformity could be inside the joint or extraarticular. That's quite important to identify intraarticular deformities because if you're going to correct the, them extraarticularly, then you will always be an element of translation because you end up, you will have to use the rule two for that. And the deformities can be in bone and could be in soft tissue. And hyperextension deformities in the tibia is an inflection deformities in the tibia is a, is a, is a good example. So if you're, if you're correcting any deformities, you must also identify how much is it in the soft tissue and how you're going to correct it or you're going to leave it. And that again depends on the etiology, whether this soft tissue uh, problem is the neurological conditions or, or is a syndromic um, patient. And therefore, that had to be looked at completely different ways uh, because bony deformities you can correct in soft tissue have to be looked at an individual basis. Uh, again, the most important thing at the end of the deformity correction is analysis of the patient and the clinical examination. But what very important is the compensation of the deformity, whether it's a mobile deformity, compensation, um, partly mobile, or it's fixed. And the great example is a tibial deformity, which has got compensatory hind foot. And that hind foot can be fixed or mobile. And if you have a fixed hind foot deformity and you correct the tibia and do not address the hind foot, then you will end up with, an, with a problem where you will have a secondary uh, deformity in the hind foot. And all deformities can be uh, uh, analyzed. All you need is, a, is an x-ray and the rotation is, is clinical examination that needs to be done separately. And Although deformity may appear complex, but if you follow the simple sequential steps, break, and break them down into problems, then it's much easier for you to analyze, identify, and correct them. And sometimes you can't correct all the deformities in, in, one, way, in, in one surgery, and therefore you need to tell patient that we will do it in a sequential basis. Always consider the soft tissue, and preoperative planning is very crucial, whether you have a complicated complex expensive software or you have a, a paper or pen there are multiple free softwares available you can use them but all but preoperative planning is very very important i thank you so much and i, I invite you to our deformity course which you 
hold in June every year. It's a is a is a five day meeting, but three day mainly for the deformity. Every year in June, please register early because we uh, course gets full by February March every year. And uh, we also have a book, and all you need to do is it's a free download. We are not charging for it. It's completely free of cost. All you need to go to the deformity course website and download the book uh, free of cost. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Hemant, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, sir, I think every one of us learned a lot about, especially the, the case examples you saw from, you showed us from the beginning when how to start the planning and how to do the deformity. So I think most of the young surgeons here and even the experienced worms have learned a lot. And uh, we also will like uh, some people from India to go and uh, see the real, real work there in the deformity course. Thanks a lot, sir. If anybody has any question, uh, Samshul, we can start with that. Uh, I have, sir, one question. Usually, mm -hmm. which uh, planning software uh, people use in UK, like Bone Ninja or like, usually what is more common in UK? So, we use TromaCAD in my hospital and a lot of hospitals, but its, it's license is single uses is 15,000 pounds per year. So it's okay. not something which is uh, I, I will recommend. <clears throat> Bone Ninja is free. There is another software which um, um, Bone Doctor or something which is available. Uh, uh, we are working on a free software and I've uh, persuaded Orthofix to uh, develop a software and I'm working on it. And hopefully in the next year or so, there'll be freestanding software available, which can be used by anybody. So, so we're working on it because my aim is to have a freestanding software, which is available to everyone. Uh, Orthofix already has a, part, a partly developed software available on their website, which you can use. And so anybody wants to register with the uh, Orthofix website and on the, uh, on the TLX, uh, uh, software they have it available, but hopefully we'll have a, a freestanding uh, next year. Apart from that, there's an Ortho View, there is a Bone Ninja, and Bone Ninja is a, I'm told free at the time of Baltimore Deformity Course. So if you want to download it, that is a good time. I don't know that. I don't have an iPad because it only works on iPad. So, um, but there's an Ortho View. So there are quite a few things are available. There are some freeware. Um, but yeah, it depends how much you want to spend. But the simplest thing is a pen and a pencil or a pencil with a paper, scissors, and some sticking tape. That works equally well. Okay, sir. Thanks. And so one more question. In India, we have now many implant like our classic Elizaro, TSF, DevFix, SUV, which is more common than currently in UK. Uh, maximum uh, what people are using here. So in UK, mainly it's the TSF and TRX we use. Uh, we have we have we have big users of hexapod because I think partly I call myself a lazy surgeon because putting in a hinge takes a lot of skill and a bit of a time, and it's quite easy for me for me to put on hexapod and don't worry about a lot of basics. Uh, so we tend to use hexapod principally TSF and TLX in my practice. The both are prevalent. I use at uh, TLX more at the minute. Okay, sir. Okay. Uh, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, well, I want to know the what is TLX. We are using the uh, TSF. So uh, it is the same thing, Ram, which is uh, designed by uh, a couple of Russian surgeons who used to work with Elezaro. Now they work in Dallas. Um, uh, so it is. It is TLX is true lock hexapod system and it is more or less same way as TSF with very minor differences uh, made by a different company. So it's another hexapod uh, like there are about five seven hexapods in the in the market and this is one of them. Okay, thank you. Okay, sir, if you have any more questions. I have sir, one more question. Uh, what's your opinion uh, about the Orthofix, the single plane fixators and the hexapod. Do you use often Orthofix also or you preferably go for the hexapods? 
So I use hexapod made by Orthofix uh, mainly. So LRS uh, or the or the rail I don't use a lot in my practice because in femur I hardly do any frames. I normally do, tend to do nail or a uh, or a plate, and in tibia frames work uh, much better. And partly because of my training, I think I'm. Uh, I didn't do use as much, but I think Mangal has uh, has got a, a massive experience along with some of you guys to do uh, rails uh, much better than uh, so. I I use I don't use a lot in my practice. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank you, sir. So, if you have any more questions, sir, shall we move uh, to the next lecture, sir? I have a question, please, uh, Mr. Shams. Sir. I have a question, please, if you let me, please, Dr. Shams. Yeah, please, please, sir. Mohammed, sir. Mohammed Sharif, I'm from Jules. Uh, my question, Dr. Hemant, is how can you, uh, in your practice, your method of, of transferring your planning into a real patient in the OT? Yeah, so that's a, that's always a, all, always a bit of challenge. So, um, um, so something for example, I can share an example. So what you need to do is you need to look at it once you've calibrated your X-rays. For example, you need to put in a hinge, and so your hinge is at certain point you can measure from from the joint or a certain point laterally, proximally, distally, whichever way, and in the real time. You can measure the joint line or the point of interest wherever you are, and you can measure your uh, your distance. So in and the, and that is the best way to translate your prior your planning onto the into the theater. There's always a, a little bit of challenge to do exactly what you want to do. So there's always a element of uh, uh, inaccuracy in it because. 100% planning is extremely difficult uh, until we develop um, a sort of software, which is sort of like a, a robotic uh, system. It is always be difficult. So there is, is a tiny amount of error, but generally that error is, is well tolerated and it works well. So, so shall we move ahead to the next lecture or if you have any more questions? So uh, I had yeah. a question for Pro. Yeah, please. Uh, sir, we will talk about hills uh, and lines in the lower limb, but uh, for upper limb planning, do you use any reference lines or hills? And the reason why I'm asking is because I had a case recently and uh, I was looking up the literature I find. So is there in that for upper limb planning? So, uh, I mean, I have to say that upper limb in terms of the planning is more like a conventional method rather than any angles. And, uh, the, uh, and the reason for, uh, for, uh, for that is because I think the deformities uh, Principally, in the lower limb, are more obvious. And being the, um, I won't say the upper limb is non-weight bearing, but in terms of uh, lower limbs take much, much uh, uh, larger weight, and the consequences are much worse in terms of the lower limb. And therefore, that is the reason that uh, uh, lower limb has the angles. Now. Um, that, that doesn't mean that uh, the, the deformities in the upper limb are less uh, uh, of little consequence because the cosmetic deformity is there. And I remember, Rajiv, you, you, you did that case, that amazing case which you did with an upper limb, which, which you planned out quite well with a 3D CT. And I think um, it again comes to the conventional lines rather than any angles which we measure in the lower in the upper limb. So I haven't answered your question. But basically, what I'm saying is that the conventional method is appears to be work reasonably well in the upper limb as far as day-to-day uh, -day practice is concerned. So I have a question, sir. Suppose you're handling a complex knee deformity where you have deformity in the distal femur and proximal tape at you. 
and you are using hexaplane in both the part and you have a less range of motion so what is the incidence of having a joint st stiffness so so the question is that if i if i'm using hexapod in the femur and tibia both yeah right sir so so the principle of so how i say it is the best advice i'll give you for putting a a frame on the femur is never put a frame in the femur that's the best advice i'll give you Excellent. okay if you have to put the frame in the femur then i would suggest is that if you have this is the femur this is your knee once you have put in your first wire you aligned it flex your knee as much as you can right and then you put all your fixation in the femur because what that will do is that will stretch your quadriceps to maximum and that way you will find that your chances of uh, uh, stiffness in the knee is is fairly minimal um so in my practice i do not use uh, fix it in the femur very very rarely and if i have to do it i put in i, I flex the knee completely um in tibia uh, we are very very careful in the sense that we have a very dedicated physio we see the patients twice a week uh, in the planning in the correction and the lengthening time and we have a regular update with the physiotherapist and uh, so that doesn't mean the patients do, don't get any flexion any stiffness but that way it's minimized so in short uh stretching the muscles how you put your frame stretching the muscles in tibia and femur number 1 number 2 uh decent release number 3 immediate post op physiotherapy and and regular physiotherapy and keeping an eye if you uh, if you having problems with the stiffness then slow down the correction sometimes stop the correction and then restart and these are all the techniques which we can we can utilize in a practice to decrease the stiffness of a joint so uh, more do you also prefer like a what i said at multiple with dr uh, professor hazabeg and uh, michael said uh, do you prefer like uh, doing a acute correction at distal femur with plates and gradual with uh, supporting tibia what is the opinion sir yeah so that's my practice i all do fixator assisted into fixation either uh, plating or a nailing of the femur uh and hex up uh, and and circular frames for the tibia occasionally when patient uh, we have a, a problem as well the our patients do not always want the frame they look at the frame and say no i don't want it in which case i do uh, plating or nailing of the tibia but generally i tend to put the frame on the tibia and remember uh, one thing i want to say that you are very correctly you told that the when you apply the frame in the femur you should have maximum flexion at the knee so what we have adopted that after when the patient comes to the ward he has a special beds and for one to two, two three days we put the limb in the flexion because there is a lot of problem the stiffness to about two one to three days we put the limb in the flexion we have a special bed that but the, because there were a lot of problem of the stiffness of the knee so now by that way we have overcome that that problems no that's a, uh, that's another uh, another good, good technique uh, yeah okay yes okay uh, dr meena has a question i suppose so, dr meena we often get the neglected uh, various deformities around the ankle post trauma or post infection they are usually associated with the rotation of the talus inside the ankle joint so how do you how do you treat these patients we have the rotation or we have the talus in the mortis and we have the various valgus deformity supramedial various valgus deformity for so these cases how do you proceed further so are these deformities uh, post traumatic or, or congenital post trauma or post infection growth arrest we have the supramedial uh, deformities along with mal orientation of the ankle joint so i think there are i think there are two uh, um so my in, in my initially in the clinically i would look at the hind foot and the midfoot problems so because if there is any hind foot and and midfoot problems what is the compensation in there and uh, and rotation of the talus within the ankle is quite hard to judge and to correct and 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 I and I think the 
way to do it is that, I mean, if you have one, in my practice, all the post-traumatic and post-infection, uh, we don't seem to find that many or hardly any uh, any tailor rotational problems. It is more rotated with the hind foot uh, with that. So what we tend to do is, we we plan and analyze all the deformity and compensation. Then we correct the tibia for, uh, on the table and and look at it that what is the hind foot position. And if the hind foot we can correct, it needs correcting. Sometimes we correct it on the table, so both the correction at the same time. Sometimes there is a compensatory uh, cavus with it as well, and that needs to be corrected as well, along with the dorsiflexion osteotomy of the first metatarsal. And, but sometimes when things are not very clear and it's very difficult to correct in one go, we tell, I, I will tell patient that we'll correct tibia first and whatever needs to be corrected at that time. Then once they start walking, go back and correct at the second stage, whatever needs correcting. Uh, to answer your question specifically, how to assess the rotational deformity, I'm not aware of any um, methods where we can uh, isolate the rotation of the tibia on the examination, either on the uh, clinical or the radiological. I think it is the compensation of the jo adjacent joints which will help us and correcting them should be able to correct the, the talus uh, along with the uh, once we correct the deformities. My question is the tibial deformities, lower tibial deformities, we can correct easily. But the, most of the times, we often get the neglected trauma or neglected post infection deformity, where we see there is rotation of the talus. So, in these cases, uh, we correct the tibia, but talus remains in the same position. And as time passes, these patients develop the arthritic changes. So, my question is how does we tackle these cases? We often get the neglected patients. So, I mean, extra articular deformity or the growth plate injury should not cause the rotation of the talus uh, or, or as it on. There has to be another uh, reason uh, why the tail. So, if the talus is not sitting congruence to the distal end of tibia, there has to be something else. Uh, in addition, there, there must be a problem. Now, if there is an intra articular problem, then that has to be tackled at a, 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 a separately. And as I said, I'm not aware, and I can't personally uh, uh, analyze the rotation of the talus in the tibia in isolation. If there's a congruence problem, either because of the talus and tibia, that often corrects with the, with the angular correction, or sometimes when you do, uh, uh, because of post-traumatic arthritis, you can do uh, uh, Taramoto type of osteotomy that can work to um, to improve the congruence and improve the patient pain, but I'm not aware of any way, or certainly I don't know any method where I can measure the rotation of the talus within the ankle joint. Mangal and Ram might know they are they are quite experienced people. They, they might be able to help, or maybe Vasu and Cherian. I'm not aware of it, sir. Thanks, sir. I think Dr. Prashant has a question. Prashant. Uh, sir, I wanted to ask that uh, you are using external, uh, I mean, circular fixators only for the sir, deformity correction or you use it for uh, treating fractures also? So, some fractures we use, so uh, severe open fractures, complex uh, 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 pl 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 plateaus and pylons, uh, not all of them, some of them, and sometimes we use for um, very complex fractures. Uh, so we, in terms of if you look at uh, pylon and plateaus, we use about uh, only types uh, type six sharp skull and type C pylons. We use mostly frames. Pylon, we are running a big trial, international trial on uh, plate versus frame. So uh, that we use to half and half at the minute. Uh, but generally, in our total trauma, a frame uses about ten to twenty percent and entire trauma we do for tibia. Not more than 20% we use frames, rest we do, we do, we use plates and nails. Okay. Thank you, sir. External Thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, so like external fixator as a definitive mode of treatment, uh, do you use external fixator? 
for that reason. Yeah, uh, so, sorry, do, do you mean in fractures? Yes, sir. So there's a definitive mode of treatment. Yes, I mean, when we put it on, we use for definite mode. And, uh, and uh, we, um, we don't have, uh, we don't have uh, enough trained people to put it as a, um, as a temporary measure. So we use Hoffman or any monolateral fixators, Galaxy or whatever we have uh, in the hospital. We use Hoffman more. Uh, and Nando Ferreira from South Africa has just published a very nice paper where they used a circular fixator as a temporizing measure rather than monolateral fixators for uh, distal tibia peel on and oh, open distal uh, tibial fractures. And they have shown quite nicely that this is much better and is more cost effective and uh, uh, way of uh, uh, method for this. So I would suggest you read that paper. Uh, it, it's a very good paper. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot. And I Thank think we you. have to again invite you in a few months for a talk on fixator assisted plating and nailing. We Absolutely. all like to learn. No problems. And, uh, thank, thanks a lot, sir. And uh, now we will be going our next speaker, Shamsul. Uh, please uh, uh, take over. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot for a wonderful talk and very active discussion. Now, next we have our Eminent faculty, Dr. P. Vasudevan, sir. Dr. P. Vasudevan, sir, is, has done his MBBS in New York from uh, Calicut Medical College, MS from uh, Kilpark Medical College, BPNB, and MNAMS. He did his MCS afterwards in RV Clinic in 1993 and uh, founded RV Field of Research in Elizabeth Technology in 1994. Now, and, uh, he is in Thangam Hospital as head of Thangam Institute of Orthopedic Super Speciality Traumatology in Elizabeth. That is he has received the prestigious Professor K.V. Sundran Memorial Gold Member for the best paper at annual meeting of Kerala Orthopedic Association held at Kotayam 1996. He has got his best paper award at Orthocon 96 gold medal for the best paper at annual meetings of Queer uh, at Square Con at uh, 2009 and for the annual meeting of TNOA at 2009. He has performed demonstration surgeries in Elizabeth technology at various medical colleges and abroad. Given an invited lecture on Elizabeth Indian Experience in 2004, May, in Bristol Orthopedic Postgraduate Program at University of Bristol, UK. Civil Jubri Oration at QA at Kotayam, Presidential Oration at Oasis uh, Kodai Canal, uh, King George Medi uh, Memorial Oration at Kua 2016. He uh, delivered professor at uh, PA Alexander Memorial Oration at uh, Arthrocon 09, held at Calicut by, by Calicut Orthopedic Element Association. He is uh, past president of Kerala Orthopedic Association. And past vice president of OASIS. And he has different presentations. He has more than 150 papers in state, national, and international conferences. A portion in Assam International Conference held at Istanbul, Turkey. Nightmare complications following simple table lengthening and another at Barcelona on deformity correction. He has publications in prestigious British Journal of Bone and Joint Disease. And can trainer block sign be positive if the hip is normal? He has standardized five pin fixtures and potential ladies factor. International at International Journal of Trauma, in Journal of Kerala Orthopedic Association on Non Unions Fingertip Injuries, in Journal of TNOA on Percutaneous K bar Fixation for Coolies Fracture, Closed Intermediary Medullary Nailing for Tibial Shaft Fractures, in Assam Newsletter on Treatment of Non Unions, had programs in Asianet TV and India Vision. He has been a faculty in more than 150 national and state conferences in orthopedics, IMA meetings. He has delivered guest lectures. And CME lectures of Kerala, TN, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka State, and National Conferences of Orthopedic Associations, and more than 100 basic and advanced Elizabeth courses in deformity course. That is a milestone. He has been a faculty in the International Elizabeth Congress in uh, Bintulu, Malaysia. Currently, he is a course director of Palakkar deformity course and that, that is conducted every year at, at Palakkar. He is a regular faculty in various national and state, uh, state conferences, Elizabeth and ECB courses, and conducts Elizabeth and deformity courses at various centers. So, with this, uh, we request to Vasudevan sir to deliver his talk. Vasudevan sir, please. Uh, thank you, Shamsul. Yeah. Is it is it visible? Yes, sir. Perfect, sir.
Shall I, I have a few cases. I think, uh, shall we go by each case by? Yeah, right, sir. Yeah. The best textbook is a patient. First, we must understand our job well. And then, and then only attempt to correct it. Because we will correct only what we know. So we must know it well to avoid disasters. That is what Hemant was mentioning. The analyzing the deformity is the most important part of part before attempting to correct it. So deformity is a deviation from normal anatomy. So that gives another point that all of us must be very well versed in normal anatomy. And we must differentiate between a contracture and deformity. Contracture is a deformity of a joint due to soft tissue. Whereas bony deformity is originating from the bone and that can be in the limb length disparities that is in the long axis and it can be rotations. Rotation means it can rotation include angulation also. And then uh, translation or in combination. Here, in this image, you can see that angulation is a rotation around a horizontal axis. There is a procurvatum deformity with the axis around that point. This is actually a rotation around that axis. Here, you can see the various deformity, which is in the anteroposterior axis, is an ang rotation around that point. So conventionally, we call these two as angulations. And rotation is again an angulation which takes place around a vertical axis. So practically, all these are angulations. There's nothing, or all, all these are rotations. So that gives an idea, no? we can combine all these things together in advanced deformity corrections. So for this an analysis of any deformity, conventionally we have to take a full length standing patella forward x-ray hip to heel. But this happens only in the majority of the cases. But some of the very, very difficult cases are not able to stand themselves. Then you have to modify your system. In some patients, the patella is already subluxated. You cannot keep the patella pointing forward. So there is always exception to the rule when you take the full length x-ray or whatever thing. Whatever you do, it, there is exception to the rule. <clears throat> but it's a general principle that we must take a full length hip to heel x-ray to calculate the mechanical axis of the lower limb. The mechanical axis is a line from the center of the femoral head to the center of the angle platform. So that is the mechanical axis. Normally, it passes through the center of the knee or just medial to it. It gets deviated when you have a deformity anywhere. But many of the cases where they have a deformity of the upper end of the femur and the distal end of the tibia, you can have a mechanical axis which is going through the center of the knee joint. For example, in a coxa vara, sometimes you may not see a mechanical axis deviation. Normally, that is a mechanical axis deviation. The mechanical axis deviation or MAD is a perpendicular distance. How do you measure that? It is not from the micro mini film. The real time measurement of perpendicular distance from the mechanical axis to the center of the knee joint. Normally, it is 0 to 16 millimeter medial. Now, alignment. Align in my alignment is an important consideration, not only for deformity correction, but important for arthroplasties 
and fracture management. All of us are very familiar. No? Whenever you do the replacement of your tire, you always go for an alignment check. So alignment is important for anyone whenever you do a joint replacement. And it is very, very important that we do not create a new deformity while correcting a deformity. So that is the importance of planning, which was clearly mentioned by Hammond earlier. So look at this young man who came to me with the instability of the right knee joint. You can see a foot drop spin at the back. The limb is looking very, very straight. That was his full length X-ray. That was his knee joint axis. It is oblique. The real issue was he had a distal femur valgus, which was corrected in the proximal tibia acutely and fixed like this. And in the process, he developed a discount of foot drop because an acute correction of the uh, virus, valgus into virus stretched the peroneal nerve and developed a foot drop. So now he has to undergo a femur correction as well as a tibial correction. And all of us must be remembering an old dictum, correct all valgus in the femur and all virus in the tibia, which is not correct in many, most of the, in, in at least some other cases, not in all cases. Generally it is okay, but always take a pinch of salt. So the is a victim of the dictum. You can see the a tibial valgus because the dictum says all valgus has to be corrected in the femur. So he had a tibial valgus but was corrected in the femur and the full knee joint was completely damaged after within 10 years. See his alignment is perfect. Even with alignment, so this result in mal orientation and mal orientation can also damage the joint. This is another victim of the dictum. He had a femur virus, which was corrected in the TB. And this fellow developed a lateral compartment arthritis of the knee joint. He was advised a total knee replacement at the age of 50 years. That is the mechanical axis. When you look at it, you can see the femur is deformed. And TB is also deformed. So it was a very complicating situation there. Then as Heyman said, we stick on to the basic principles. Draw the joint orientation line, draw the distal femur line, and draw the femur mechanical axis. LDFA and LPFS are normal. So though, though there is a diaphyseal deformity in the femur, there was a compensatory deformity uh, correction on either side, and the femur ultimately falls in the right position. And you can see the iatrogenic tibial deformity alone has to be corrected. So that was again, he had a childhood myelinated femur shaft, looking like a crooked femur, but well aligned. Nature, the great surgeon has corrected the femur deformity at both ends. And the iatrogenic genu valgus was not being corrected by the nature. And resulted in lateral compartment arthritis. And he was advised total knee replacement. So this is how I corrected it. I just made it straight. You can see the lateral compartment is much better and you can even squat on the floor. This was a very, very interesting uh, X-ray. Okay, McMurray was taught me when a 13 or 14 year old girl, she developed, McMurray was taught me, I think after many surgeries, a neck of femur has healed after McMurray was taught me. Uh, she was happy with it, living with it, and developed knee pain at the age of 35 years. See, an innocent-looking knee, perfect knee at 35 years. She had knee, knee pain at this time. And came, I, I saw her at 53 years. See, by the time the lateral compartment is completely damaged. See that the mechanical axis is shifted like this. This was how she was walking. That is a full-length X-ray. The lateral compartment is completely gone. So, mal alignment test is very, very important. Uh, and you must know the normal values. 
you must know how to do the normal alignment and orientations because once you know the normal then you will be familiar with mal alignment and mal orientation now look at this girl can anyone say what deformity is this here the heel is looking forward anteriorly the foot is backward there seems to be a rotation in the leg and there is a hip flexion contracture and the some sort of very complicated one and this was the x ray i got and this x ray shows the neck the, this is a full the x ray they put the femur knee with hip you can see lateral view in the ap and you can see the fibula on the medial side so the x ray we are only as good as our x rays if you don't get a good x ray you cannot analyze any of the issues so our analysis becomes bad and results become bad so that is very important point how to take a good x ray and the difference between the best and the worst analysis or result is a good x ray so for this girl with this x ray i cannot do anything so technicians are trained to take x rays of normal people in anatomical positions when anatomy is distorted we have to go to the x ray room and help the technician to get a good x ray because ultimately the x ray is for us not for the technician in most complex deformities as hemond was mentioning there is a primary deformity that is the real deformity and a compensatory the secondary compensatory deformity which may be correctable which may not be correctable sometimes and that was made by the patient as a compensation for the primary for walking so how to find it out as again i have mentioned we need the there nothing to substitute a detailed clinical examination and that is the only key when a, when you are in trouble look at all the identifiable anatomical landmarks of the limb you can feel anterior iliac spine try to feel the gt try to feel the knee joint axis knee movements feel the fibula head and feel the middle malleolus lateral malleolus and try to place all this in the right position and also don't forget about patella for this girl i just try to examine her i felt the middle malleolus and trying to see the knee joint range of movements and i felt the patella on my index and i try to keep the patella to the floor and that is the knee range of movements and uh, see that is adduction abduction of the hip joint and that is how it is the patella pointed forward and this was how she was compensating so it was looking complicated only because of the compensation by the patient otherwise see here again in this image you can see the how she her knee axis movement is so can you take a standing x ray for this girl she is not even even able to stand now i took her for an x ray and felt the patella pointing forward facing to the roof and got her x ray so you it was a extreme femur valgus you can see the proximal mechanical axis or the anatomical axis and the distal axis it is not crossing anywhere in the bone or in the limb or even in the floor to reaching far below the floor so i had to draw the green line that is the middle line and she had a 105 degrees of the distal femur valgus and 65 degrees of the middle femur valgus totaling about 170 degrees of valgus so there are two coras i need to do a osteotomy at this level i need to do an osteotomy at that level and correct it so here you can see i cannot pass a reference wire reference wire will be like this i am not able to pass a reference wire i am not not able to pass, I mean, do a it band release i am not able to do a peroneal nerve release because i cannot even put my finger in between these two even you can see this 
this femur, the tibia was going to that side because it was supposed to go like this. The soft tissue was, soft tissue was pushing it medial. So that is the real deformity there. What are the concerns here? We have no idea where the neurovascular structures are. I have done a Doppler and marked it with a pen and how to retain it till the end of the surgery. To put wires and pins from medial side. I cannot put from lateral side, all from medial side. And how to do osteotomy from medial side because there is no entry from the lateral side. Can I do a peroneal nerve release? Can I do an IT band release? How to make a frame? How to put the hinges and distract it? So all of these problems can be solved when you are relaxed and thinking about it. It may take some time, but still it is quite possible. So whenever I need to control a bone segment slowly over a longer period in various planes, I resolve to illusion. She had about a good range of knee movements, but I warned her she will may not get much movements and may need a cortisol flash to leave. So they have to accept it. There's no other way. The magic of illusory fixator is I can make a, or we all can make a replica of the underlying bone deformity. This is the replica of the deformity. This is a femur axis. This is a tibial axis. And you can see two, one core, one core or second core. So that is the frame. And the, the main issue was how to retain this line. This is the femoral artery line. I can do one osteotomy here, this other osteotomy at this level. So how to retain the, this line during surgery? As you prepare, the whole thing will go. Then my daughter told me, you can just apply henna over there. That will stay for two weeks. The five rupees henna, I applied on that. And she was happy I could, know, I could do the surgery. That was the frame. And all problems can be tackled well. I did the osteotomy there and digital osteotomy. You can see the cut only from medial side. I don't want to keep any wire on this side. And you can see the shan screws there. There's another shan screw there. Dis distally on the tibia, we have only two shan screws. Middle, I have two shan screws and on the tibia. And as the frame, you can see these are all half rings. And this is a distra one distractor there. This is the other di distractor. As it comes out, I have added all the uh, all the other half rings in between. So you can see it is coming out. I've added more rings. Still more coming. You can see one more ring has been added and distraction continues and it becomes straight. So from there to here and that is the result. So it was not a smooth ride. It took many, many sleepless nights, but still it is doable. This was how she was walking earlier. This was how she was walking after six weeks of removal of the frame. She had some 30 degrees movement on the knee and was not willing for a cortisol plasty. She got married and has two children now. Shamsul, we, do we stop here and discuss it? Yes, sir, we can, sir. Or we'll go, we'll finish the presentation. So, if you have, you can stop this there and discuss and you can take another case or you can uh, read the both of cases and then discuss, sir. You can finish and discuss, sir. We'll finish it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, now we go on to the, that is uh, frontal plane deformities. You can have frontal plane deformity, virus, valgus and Boeing deformities in the femur or even the tibia. Mm -hmm. So, he was actually referred to me for HDO. He had a frontal pain virus deformity and a limited knee range of movements. This was his full length X-ray. You can see he is having a distal femur virus and a proximal tibial virus, limb length discrepancy of about 3 centimeters and quadriceps additions. So, as I overall treatment, you have to treat all these issues. You cannot manage this one just by a HTO. So wherever I can get a safe acute correction, I prefer LCPs or interlocking nails. 
over n illusion. So here the femur I decided to do a acute correction, a quadriceps plasty. From there I got flexion like this and fixed the distal femur by LCP. In the tibia, I decided, you can see that suture marking there. In the tibia, I decided to go for illusor. Wherever I can't get a safe acute correction or I need lengthening, I prefer illusor over an implant. So here, and it's easy in the tibia. I did the osteotomy there and lengthening. That is the femur implant. You can see that lengthening has been consolidated. About 3 centimeters has been lengthened. And from there, he can stand straight. He is an architect professor. His architect has been corrected well. So this is a bilateral. You can see the full length x-ray. There is a diaphyseal deformity in the femur. There is a knee joint deformity. There is a tibial deformity. This is the mechanical axis shift. So all these things together. So I did the femur correction by nail and the tibial correction by illusor. This is after full correction. Whereas this girl came to be for illusor correction. She had distal femur valgus. So I don't have to do a distal femur valgus by illusor. I just plan like this. Distal femur osteotomy and plating. So this was how before and after. That was how I just played. I didn't do in such cases. I don't do even a uh, wedge removal. Just osteotomy and fix it. It automatically comes. And here we can see here the distal pin is parallel to the knee joint. I got reasonably good correction. Here you can see it is not perfectly parallel. I have to keep the plate little off. So this man came to me because no girl was ready to marry him. He had a very complex deformity of the foot, knee, and hip. So when you see all this complex deformity, that means we are missing something else. It is not this deform. This is not the real deformity. As Hamad was mentioning, there was a secondary compensatory deformity here because the patient has to walk with the foot on the floor. So he is doing so many tricks in his body. The real deformity was this. Bilat, can we take a standing x-ray for this boy? It's impossible to take a full length x-ray standing. So I took multiple films and x-ray like this. So that is the mechanical axis. And he had a distal femur uh, joint uh, valgus and intra-articular deformity and extra-articular tibial deformity. So I did, this was a case long back. I did all illusoro. The femur also I did illusoro, but that was acute correction. And, the, and uh, this is the tibial correction. This is before and after. So this is a bilateral bow leg deformity. You can see the mechanical axis going here. This is a proximal femur mechanical axis. Distal femur mechanical axis. This is a resolution cora. So I decided to do one osteotomy for the femur. Resolution cora, whereas tibia, I want to maintain as anatomical axis also. So mid, I put draw the middle line and one osteotomy there, another osteotomy here, one osteotomy, two osteotomies for the tibia and one osteotomy for the femur. Because more osteotomy means more headache. If you have, if I am planning for two osteotomies in the femur, then I will have more headaches. In tibia, I can manage the headache. So I did that. This was the pre-assembly, which was fixed onto the femur. Did the osteotomy there. This is on the tibia. You can see the two distractives and two cort one corticotomy for femur, two for the tibia. And these are the distractives. Before and after. See, it is fully corrected now without losing any, any function. Now we will go on to the sagittal plane deformities. This is a stiff node with the sclerotic bone ends. It looks like two knee joint and there's a six centimeters of limb length disparity. All sclerotic bones are not bad bones, except you can see a small tiny sequestrum. But when there is no soft tissue problem there, patient is happy, no discharging sinus, 
I am not going to bother about this tiny secution. So limb length disparity can also be, I can use this as a uh, corticotomy. I am using that as a corticotomy at a lower space. So no plan for opening. I put a frame like this. This is a distractor because it is touching almost each other. You have to modify putting distractors and that is how the distractors are working. And after full correction of the deformity. This is his function before and after. He can squat. All the sclerotic bone has completely disappeared. This is a step knee. You can see a knee joint and a step here. What is this deformity? It's a sagittal plane recurvatum deformity. So this was the magnitude of the deformity. So I have to do an osteotomy here and bring it here. So osteotomy at this cora level is impossible because this is a tibial tuberosity. So I need to do an osteotomy at this level. So that means it becomes a osteotomy rule two as mentioned by uh, in the deformity planning by Hammond. So osteotomy rule two. So this is what I did. She had a limb length disparity of that much. So two level, one level limb lengthening here and deformity correction there plus lengthening. So this was the frame looking like the hinge is at that point. This is the osteotomy level. So you can see the osteotomy, it got translated and ultimately it got remodeled very well. You can see the regenerate going on both sides and before and after. Now, axial plane rotations and uh, translation generally I resolve to SUV corrections. I don't, nowadays I don't do with the ring fixators. So, look at a very rare case of popliteal pterygium syndrome on a six year old girl who underwent soft tissue release and just elsewhere for correction of her FFD. You can see that was her sciatic nerve and sciatic nerve was looking there. So, initially I was not very well versed with anatomy. So, I started exploring all these cases. So, while exploration I found, after removal of that uh, anomalous muscle called calcaneo ischiaticus, that's a, a muscle band coming from ischial tuberosity, it goes to the tendo Achilles and calcaneum. So, I excise that muscle. Within that muscle, there was, a, there was a sciatic nerve. You can see the sciatic nerve there. So, with that movement, I cannot get much of movement, maybe at 10 degrees of movements. So even after extensive soft tissue release, only a jog of improvement was there in the FFD. So I stopped doing exploration in further two cases I did it, then I stopped doing it. So challenge is the short sciatic nerve under the skin as a bowstring. To correct FFD, we must lengthen the sciatic nerve. We do not have a technology for sciatic nerve lengthening, except Elizaro, which does it slowly and re and at the same time it realigns the knee joint holes. So this was the frame looking like here. We can see the the center board medially and laterally because I am not able to keep the full ring here. So to get that much of flexion, you have to be two half rings, and uh, this is how it was correcting. And this is an extension and flexion. I put the frame there and these half rings, because if you just imagine if you have this full ring, then you will not be able to put that ring. So it is easy now you can distract it here. So as it, as it comes out, so that is the that is the Cora. That is the place where the sighting nerve was lying. While distracting, you take the distance from the hinge to the distractor, divide by distance from the hinge to the sciatic nerve. So this, in fact, all the lengthening is depending on the sciatic nerve. One millimeter for the sciatic nerve, you plan it and lengthen it. At the same time, you try to keep a physial hinge, physial wire. You can see this is an organization wire print, organization wire system adapted to the hinge. So I put organization wire into the uh, epiphysis. 
So this is how it was coming out. And as it comes out, I added more half rings and the distractors has been changed. So I got the full correction like that. And that is how even hyper extension, I got full lengthening of the sciatic nerve. That is after removal of the frame on long-term bracing. Before and after. She has full extension, but there's a lag there. Now going into the oblique plane deformity, where you can see the deformity both in AP and lateral. So this is actually an oblique plane, not, not a biplanar deformity. You find out the plane of deformity based on your oblique plane planning. And keep appropriate hinge. You can see one hinge here on andro andromedial side. And here is the andro I mean, posterolateral side. So this is the oblique hinge and that the distract. This is after correction. You can completely correct it just in one go. You can correct all the deformities together. That is his function. Before, I mean, this is after, it is fully aligned. You cannot even find out which leg was fractured. Now, something very complex that doesn't fit anywhere. Look at this girl. She, I had that character, deformity correction in her uh, in, during the, the, this period. But later on, I lost her follow-up. She came to me when she was a final year, I mean, fourth year MBBS student. She had a limb length disparity of about 12 centimeters. There was a valgus external rotation deformity for her and very limited knee range of movement like 30 degrees. So 36 degree valgus, 30 degree external rotation, 12 centimeters limb length disparity and only 30 degrees of knee range of movement. So I don't want to do any femur uh, frame on her. So I have to save the 30 degrees of knee range of movement. <clears throat> Now, to preserve her knee range of movement, I must avoid a frame on her femur. As uh, Hammond was mentioning, I don't like frame her in the femur. So, I have to correct the valgus and the external rotation without bone loss. I don't want to take any segment of bone out because I have to save maximum bone length. And still, I have to fix it with the LC. And I have to correct the LLD in the tibia. So, how to do the valgus, 36 degree valgus correction and external rotation deformity without removal of any wedges? So, I started doing work with my bananas. So, I cut one banana like this. this you can see this is the anterior side. I just marked a toothpick for anterior, just put, put a toothpick for posterior. I made a 90 degree deformity and see how and, and put a toothpick for the hinge. I because this is now having. 90 degree deformity and 180 degree rotations. Is it possible to correct it without removal of any hinge? See, the posterior part comes anteriorly and I can correct all the deformities. That is 90 degree virus and rotations, 180 degree rotations can be corrected easily by without removing any bone. If I can do that on that bone model, why not I try on the another bone, another banana? I took banana with the same angle because plenty of bananas are available. And I marked the rotations 30 degree virus and 30 degree external rotation. And calculated the it's a complex calculation, calculated the axis and converted into an oblique plane. Did the osteotomy and that was the hinge. So this was one plane. This is you can see in a 30 degree rotations. So I put the toothpick to find out that, I mean, the real plane. And uh, I saw I could correct both. I could align it and rotations has been corrected now. And I can lock, do a lock-in plate. So I found I can do that 30 degree virus and 30 degree external rotation on a banana. If I can do it on a banana, why not I do it on a femur? So I did it on the femur, same and fixed with a <clears throat> locking plate and the tibial correction has been done on the so I saved a lot of bone and corrected on the tibia and that was the final uh, correction looking like this was the final healing this was how she was walking Now, this is a four-year-old boy with a very strange deformity of both lower limbs. 
it doesn't look that bad there but this x-ray was very confusing you can see that it was coming like this and there are a lot of other complications it was a sad story of bilateral traumatic amputation which was re-implanted it was like this so they re-implanted it most probably they must have done the femoral artery uh, graft but the femur, the thigh part, when you do a femoral artery repair, the thigh part has no blood supply from the femur, femoral artery. It must get it from the profunda femoris. Probably that is not repaired and the distal femur went in for AVN. And that is probably that is why the distal femur was like this. The femoral condyle was a little bit different. And that was the reason for the AVN. And anyway, the limb is saved. That was how the limb was looking like. I could not feel femoral artery. I don't know what is the status. I didn't know. Because it is fully equal. Some tau movement was there. Femoral condyle, I could not find it out. And even patella was very difficult to find. So problems everywhere. Anatomy was completely distorted. Where is the femoral artery? The posterior tibial and dorsal speedis was felt. Nerves, I have no idea on how to do a corticotomy. I took a 3D CT and I didn't go for a printing. So this was the image I got. So you can see the how it was moving. But the femoral condyle was, as you said, it is come as I said, it was completely dysplastic. There is no posterior part. Probably, and the CT report was. A, a, a stiff non-union leg. There was a non-union in the CT. That was the shape of the bone. And now, if the femoral was dysplastic, post-AVN, patella was very small, CT was showing a non-union. And there was a femoral shortening also. So left side, there's a tibial shortening with the talipus equinovirus deformity leg. So I took the printout and superimpose. You can, you can see the deformity here, an extension deformity, and the equal amount of flexion contraction. So there's a hidden patella there and an equinous deformity. So you have to correct this, and there was a various deformity that has to be corrected, and the flexion has to be corrected, and the equinous has to be corrected. So this was how it was looking. I have to do an osteotomy at this level, because partly it is healed here. I have to do an osteotomy. So this was the hinge looking like, the frame looking like, so uh, the frame to carry recurvatum, virus, rotation and shortening at femur all together. A complex frame, the femoral osteotomy from the back, there's the apex, knee FFD correction and the ankle equence correction. <coughs> Slow correction at three levels after five days. So it started coming back coming to normal position. So I did it on the other side also. So after the correction, he is walking with the frame. After frame removal, for the first time he is walking in the, in, on his feet. So this was a master case. You can see the, he came to correct the limb limb disparity. It was a very snake leg looking leg. The foot was deformed. With the complex deformity there. These were x ray looking like this, not only of the tibia. The fibula was healing with the proximal tibia. It was already operated. And here we can see the fibula, this is not healed. A complex multiplanar deformity by fibula and limb lung disparity due, caused due to childhood infection. So with Elizoro, we can play with it. We have total freedom. So I planned it like this proximal axis. Then I came to the fibula, a one cora there, another cora here. So I did that, I tried to correct it like this. So from where the tibia, femur, tibia starts, here it goes to the fibula and the fibula deformity correction. At the end of the deformity correction, I translated the distal tibia after one osteotomy there to the proximal tibia, the fibula. Yeah, this was the frame looking like a very strange frame on the job started correcting 
That is how I got the length back. And some deformed, you can see the heel is in valgus. So if I try to correct more, then her foot will create more because this is already human uh, lock. The joint, subtalar joint was already in valgus. So it was, I'm not able to correct more. So I did only that much. The foot is plantigrade and this virus was accepted. So before and after. So as a first step, let us understand it well and then, then only attempt to correct it. We will only correct what we know. So spend some time to know it well, to study it well, plan it well and nothing is impossible. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vasudevan. I think it, it was a full master course for everyone. Uh, having a know-how of every type of deformity they can think on. So, uh, uh, if anybody ha wants to ask any question, the house is open for discussion. Uh, Dr. Vasu, uh, I want to know but that medical girl who was having the deformity at the femur. Yeah. You uh, put the LCP plate yeah. And you have not done the lengthening of the bone. But I think very well that can be corrected, the deformity by Elijarab, and we can do the lengthening of the femur. What do you think? Why you have not done the lengthening of the femur? She had because only 20 degrees are... of knee movements. Yeah. I don't want to lose that movement. But there is a disparity of the knee joint which I'm looking after the post operative. That I discussed with her and acceptable. Yeah. The more important for the knee movement than the length in the femur. I can correct in the tibia. So once I save the bone from there, I could uh, I could do only very like uh, six, seven centimeters lengthening on the tibia. But one thing I uh, tell you, I Dr. Hemant told me that wherever you operate and apply the frame, you put the maximum flexion of the deformity in the limb, knee joint of the flexion. And in the post-operative, we also always put the limb into the flexion, especially beds. So personally, I feel if you keep the bed in the flexion deformity and apply the frame on the flexion deformity, then very well knee joint movement can be saved. So here the problem uh, is I don't want to compromise that 30 degrees. Heaven? Yeah, no, heaven. See, I think Elizabeth, we can do gain length. So 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 personally, I would have done the same. Uh, I would have done probably slightly differently because complex oblique osteotomies to correct rotation and angulation are pretty hard. And, and the sleepless night osteotomy and work and still there's a possibility of things going on. So, so that was a fantastic case, Vasu. And to be honest, all your cases have always been amazing. Uh, but I think in terms of, I would have probably done the same because in a sense, if I can preserve the knee, if whatever we have, I would do the same. I would always fix the dental fixation in the femur if I had a chance. And uh, if you can correct the deformity, then internal fixation, you have a less chance of scarring of the cordyceps. And even if you have to do an, uh, do cordyceps or something later on, you have a better chance of success because the scarring would be much less and easier for patient. Patients hate femoral frames, absolutely. And, and a girl of that age to tolerate the frame for nearly 12, one year. Dr. Body, what do you think? Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah. All my Indian friends, British friends, Hemant Sharma, just I was listening everything. Uh, congratulations to Mr. Hemant Sharma and Vasudevan. It's a very fantastic case. The difficult cases, learning for everyone. And uh, regarding the Heman Sharma, uh, he's my very good friend. And I enjoyed his lecture. And the only one question that is uh, coming through uh, after the lecture of uh, Heman Sharma, 
regarding the infection in the femur and the shortening, it is very difficult without Yilizarov to correct all these problems in the femur. Infection with shortening. And regarding the Basudaman lecture, regarding the pterygium, I am facing a lot of problems with these cases in my country. And the result is very good when you do a simple osteotomy of the femur. Part, if you remove, you can correct the deformity without doing the any soft tissue release or lengthening of the sciatic nerve. You can proximally remove or distal remove, and at the same time, you can correct the deformity of the pterygium. I am doing now this kind of operations. Before that, I was releasing the soft tissue, applying the Elizaro only with the wires, playing with the wires, not with any shards. And if you go for this, your one case, two cases that you have shown, lengthening of the shite is now fantastic. But I think if you go for shortening of the distal femur or proximal femur, you can easily correct these cases. And I have a series more than now, 12 cases of this kind of uh, cases in, in case of children. So thank you very much, Vasudevan. The deformities that you have shown, really, I'm also doing this kind of deformities. And it gives very much pleasure to the surgeon, to the relatives of the surgeons, and as all well the patients. Yes, sometimes it gives very much painful uh, regarding the application of Ilizarov. No other alternative way you cannot do it. Uh, whatever you want to do, the very complex deformity correction, you should have to go for Ilizarov. And in the third world country, like India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, and uh, this Bhutan and uh, Nepal, everywhere, we are getting lots of cases. You see in my country, 18 crore people, 18 crore, think yourself. Now India is the top in the whole world. Uh, exceeded even China, the population. Now regarding the deformity, you see, if you think about the 10% deformity of the country, out of 17 crore people, we are getting lots of cases. And uh, I'm telling you the truth, and I'm facing, and I'm doing this kind of deformities that Vasudevan and Hamad, and uh, in England, you're not getting that kind of, that we are getting in our, uh, this region. Am I true? I think you will be uh, agree with me. Thank you very much, Hemant and Vasudha, but I always enjoy your lecture. I learn from my mistakes. I've learned from your lecture. And uh, hopefully I will be able to show the difficult cases later on when they will invite me. Thank you very much again. Thank you, very sir, for valuable input. Thank you, sir. No, can I yeah, just say... Uh, let's go with the case presentation. Yeah, yes, sir, please. Just a, just a comment on um, uh, Bari. So um, uh, I think one of the things I think we need to, there is no first or second or third world. We are all part of the similar world. Some have more money, some have less money. I don't think the classification of first and second we shouldn't be doing because uh, earning more money does not mean it's first. There are a lot of other things. So that's a separate debate. So I won't go into that. Uh, the most important thing is I think the cases you guys get, get it says, are far more complex than I get. And I think the population uh, demands in terms of the expectations of the treatment is very different from we get in Europe or is very different from, from what you get. So there's no question about it. The, the, the type of deformities and things you do are, are, are much more complex than we do because we have a better system of identification. There's a social social service structure, which which can identify things early. There's enough money in the healthcare system to support the people. That is the reason we don't get complex deformity. But I think that is actually emphasizing the point a lot more what Vasu has so, so nicely pointed out that it is not the correction which is important, what you use which is important. It is more important to understand it and you can give the patient what is best for the patient. Whether we do a frame, if we can't do a plate, that's fine. If we can do a nail, a frame. But equally, if we can do something, it's important. And I think understanding what you are doing 
And what is the problem? That is a critical bit. How you hold it, that's completely secondary and uh, and sort of le- uh, and less important. So I think what Vasu has pointed out is is, is 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 in so well in his cases is that how we should apply the principles, and that's what I will emphasize every time that implant is secondary, principles and understanding the problem is primary. Thanks. Yeah, Doctor Bairi, I don't now. I have stopped. That was my initial cases. I used to explore the pterygiums. Only two cases I did, and I found there is no benefit of doing that. Nearly two, two and a half, three hours of work. And regarding your shortening, I know it, that's an easy procedure. So what will be the end result? Like at the end, you will have a very short lip. If I am lengthening the sciatic now. I can get save that bone, and you know, in in six months time, or I think in three months time, the correction is done. Where in the bone, by lengthening, you have to wait that much period for to consolidate the length at a later stage. You can get a correction, but what about limb length disparity? You can go for second option, second step surgery. Yeah, that you can be avoided by correction first. Yeah, then you go for lengthening. Yeah, that's all. You that know, can be avoided by one step. You can do that. You can yeah. do that. But but correcting the pterygium deformity and second stage you can go for length. Pterygium is you know, not a it's not a difficult problem at all. Later on, not same situation. Yeah, at any time, even that time it is not a problem. You put the appropriate hinge, go by one millimeter for the sciatic nerve. That is the right limiting step. It's not a problem. Okay, it's much okay. easier than the short. Shortening is for easy surgeons, no? For you and me, I don't think you need a shortening. Sh- shortening I, and... Yeah, I agree with Doctor Badi. Said first you correct the deformity, and after that you do the lengthening. And sometimes we do the quadriplasty also, quadricep plasty. So that gives a very good result for the knee joint movements. Okay. Okay, sir. Let's let's Thank go you. with the case discussion. We are already uh, running out of time, so I think Shamsul, uh, let's start with the case uh, discussion. We have uh, one or two very important questions from YouTube. Shall I ask, sir? Okay, let's do it quickly. Yeah. Do it quickly, sir. For uh, Hemant, sir, there is an important question. Uh, what should be the sequence of deformity correction, rotation, translation, angulation, shortening, lengthening? Mm-hmm. Hemant, sir. So please unmute, sir. Sorry, say that again. What is so, the question? What is yeah, what would be the sequence of deformity correction, rotation, translation, angulation, shortening, lengthening? The sequence. So translation should be last because whenever do you, you if you are doing a rotation, because whenever you do rotation, your bone is not in the center of the ring. It always translates. So the translation you better off correcting last. Although with angulation, you so our correct angulation first. If it's a rotation, you you have to do that. If you are doing a hexapod, you can do all together. It really doesn't matter. On your uh, um, your deformity, then you will know what will happen. How much you have to translate, but the translation last if you are correcting the, the the rotation. Also, there's one more question. That acute angle you correct, and after how much angle you do gradual correction? Am I correct, Master Sir? So. Uh, again, there is no limit. It depends on the type of the tissue, the, the direction. If you have a valgus deformity, you do much less. If you have a, a virgin valgus deformity, you can do more as compared to previously operated val- valgus uh, de- de- deformity. So there are a number of factors. There is no set guideline for this. If you are doing angulation and rotation, you tend to do less. And usually, uh, generally, 20 to 30 degrees uh, up to 30 degrees you can do and it, the, actually there is no number for it. If you are in doubt then release the nerve and uh, to do it less and do gradually uh, but it depends on the soft tissue, the previous surgery, the um, whether it is a congenital problem, is a post-traumatic scarring, all that will will determine the how much acute correction you do. So the last question is from uh, Vasu sir. Vasu, uh, what's your opinion? Sorry. Yeah, what's please? No, nothing. Okay, sir. So in such uh, cases of exception of scanoblam, 
How do you suggest to take such complex deformities? What is sir? Can you do a scanogram, sir? Scanogram? In such complex deformities, uh, can you do a scanogram in, this, in such cases? No, no. While uh, the patient is not able to stand, I will take a uh, do the multiple pieces and connect it. I think uh, 3D CT is good, sir. 3D CT, yes. You can take a 3D, but the, so this complex patient will not go through the CT machine. So, thank you, sir. So, we, we are running like a time. So, we'll just move to the case decision part. So, without wasting time, I'll request uh, uh, first Dr. Cherin Kubu, sir. Here's a talk on uh, post axial lower limb deficiency with conjunctive infusion. Cherin, sir, please share your screen, sir. Yeah, one minute. Now, the Kanai Kalin. Can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay. okay. Now, this is a rather complex reflection conjecture which I had treated about 12 years ago, well, about 14 years ago. This is a nine year old girl. She came with a complaint that she cannot straighten the knee and she walks almost uh, crawling. The right knee range of motion is nil, absolutely zero. And the left knee had a full range. Foot had absent lateral range. So this is the picture. The right knee is flexed to about 120 degrees and both the feet have absent lateral rise. So the x-ray showed on the right side a fused knee joint in 120 degrees with, as expected, no motion at the knee. This is the x-ray of the left side. This is how she walks, came to my OPD and this is the way she came to my OPD, almost crawling on the ground. Now the diagnosis we made was after a lot of discussion and uh, in various forums, we came to this diagnosis that is post-axial limb deficiency with congenital fusion of the knee on the right side and left side post-axial limb deficiency because the fibula is absent on both sides. Now, the question is, how do we go about this case? What are our options? DCS would be a through knee amputation and walk, make you walk with the processes, but short, and the parents were certainly not keen and the child also was not too keen about it. Shortening and acute correction, but 120 degree of uh, deformity, I don't think you can shorten and acutely correct it. The only option is gradual correction. So, and it's not an easy job. So she, we did the deformity planning, the femoral and tibial axis and the middle line. We planned for osteotomies. We planned for actually three osteotomies, as you can see in the pink lines. That is where we planned for the osteotomies. And we, we did a paper tracing, did uh, with the trace, three osteotomies. Anyway. This is a frame we made. It's a rather complicated frame because we had to do a pull construct rather than a sorry a push construct pull construct sorry push construct rather than a pull construct because the con uh, deformity I mean the, on the concave side we couldn't fit any distraction rod so we had to fit the distraction rods on the convex side and this is the frame the thigh part and the leg part. So this is the frame on the patient. On the foot, uh, in the leg, there is a ring and ring, additional ring in the foot. This is the frontal view. That's a plantar view. We ultimately did only two osteotomies uh, because there was only space for two osteotomies because we couldn't place the third rings, uh, another ring here, this side. So we just did only two osteotomies. And we did initially just lengthening of the corticotomy sites, not uh, any angular correction. We lengthened for about three, four centimeters and continued lengthening with the tibial deformity and uh, through the femoral deformity, we did the deformity correction. So this is the deform destruction rod on the convex side of the femur. All, all the destruction rods are on the convex side. This is the picture post-op. Slowly, the deformity is correcting. Slowly, deformity is ultimately corrected. 
this is the fully corrected picture. And that's the regenerate needs to consolidate a little more. That's fully corrected now, the deformity. That's the X-ray after full correction. This is a clinical picture after full correction. This is how she was walking. Now, if you compare the way she was walking previously and now, it's a lot of quite a bit of difference. This is about eleven year follow up. She's still short stature, but now she's joined for some fashion designing course. She's a very intelligent girl. That's a side view. That's a deformity that's fully correct. Now, post-axial deficiency with congenital fusion of the knee, it's a very, very rare combination of deformity. So only four cases have been uh, reported so far. Can be associated with another rare syndrome called the Robert syndrome, that's the pseudo syndrome. But fortunately, she didn't have any of those features anyway. And these are the various limb deformities or uh, not deformed limb uh, deficiencies. So this is a post-axial deficiency. Post-axial deficiency means on the ulna side, uh, the ulna side is not there in the upper limb and the lateral side is not there in the lower limb. So complex deformities like this need a lot of planning. So always anticipate problems as Vasu and Hemant have said. Gradual correction is the best solution. And you need a very versatile apparatus, which can be modified. And I think the only apparatus that fits a bill is the Elisa apparatus and nothing else. So that's about the short case I wanted to present. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any push up on the panel, please? I think uh, Professor Omar Ali, he wanted to speak something. Please unmute yourself, sir. Unmute. Unmute, sir. Omar Ali, please unmute. Okay. Can you listen, please? Yeah, you yes, can. Sir, please. Yes, please sir. Come, sir. This was not, uh, thank you so much for your kind presentation. This was not the case of fibular hemimelia. What about the fibula? Pardon, sir? What about the fibula? Is it, it, it was present or it was absent also? It was absent. It was a post-axial deficiency, sir. Yes, we can we can say fibular hemimelia. Yeah, it is a fibular hemimelia with the congenital fusion of the knee. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any other questions, sir? Or shall we move ahead? So in the meantime, if you have any questions, we shall move to the next uh, case discussion by Dr. Shibu John Vagia, sir. He is talking on a case which is not indicated for Elizabeth Shibu, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Please go full screen, sir. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Please go full screen, sir. Okay. Please. Perfect, sir. Please. Yeah. Good evening, now. Actually, this is not a typical case for Indizaro method. And since I was told, I thought of putting out this. Sometime back in 2014, the 65-year-old female patient was brought with complaints of pain, instability of both knees, and difficulty in walking. Again, I mentioned that there are different ways of doing this, and uh, this is not a typical case for Elizaro method. So this lady was brought to us with this complaint of difficulty in walking and instability of both knees. This is how the clinical picture appeared. Rather, with some kind of rotation more on the right side. 
Any suggestions, opinion, please? In fact, uh, what I did is I first sent her to the um, to different people. Later on, after about 10 months or so, she got back to us. This is how her x-rays appeared. Seeing, seeing this x-ray, what we did is we went and asked her to go and I called that surgeon who operated. I said, uh, it's better that you handle her and we send her back to him. This was done four years prior to her visit. That means in uh, 2010 or so it was done. And after four years, she, it was finding, she was finding very difficult to walk. So this is the X-ray picture. There was much of black city on the right side. Excuse me, something has gone wrong. One sec. Can you see me? Yes, sir. Please share the screen again, sir. Sorry? Is, this, is, uh, yeah. is Please screen share screen? it. No, sir. Not it, sir. Okay. Sorry. One sec. In the meantime, sir, yeah, yeah please, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So this is what we did after explaining because she gave, got back to us when going around different places, she got back to us and uh, we had no other option but to try doing this. She was sent to some eminent reconstructive surgery, surgeons also, but uh, she was not very keen on doing any of those things. So we tried with one, of course, we mainly looked for the clinical access because with the implant in situ, it was not very easy for a proper osteotomy of the cora or aka. So first went for the right. In the, in the theater, this is how the knees looked. We put those marker wires and took an X-ray to plan osteotomy and plan the wire insertion sites. Because the uh, laxity and instability of the knee we extended to the distal part of femur also, span the knee joint. It's with the x-rays with the frame on. X-rays after correction. And her right knee after correction. After a gap of two months, we went for the left knee. Of course, this was also, we spanned the knee joint, but later on, we converted into below frame, below knee frame, and she was walking with it. That's the left knee. X-rays. To our surprise, about a week back, she landed up in the hospital just for a review. That's, this was done in 
now about a week back she came and this is how her limb looked and she's kind of comfortable she's walking with it and that's it this is a short case that i wanted to share with you all thank you thank you sir for a wonderful case any questions from the panel yeah it's a fantastic surgery really so can i just ask uh, sir what is your is the it was the problem ligamentous specifically because the tibial slope there's a lot of problems with the knee replacement there's a tibial slope was reversed so that will give you extension to probably and uh, the alignment i'm not sure there's no uh, true ap of the knee with the to suggest the line but by the looks of it there seems to be a instability because of the uh, problem with the lateral structures There's right. the soft tissue. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. The lateral structures were really oh. lax, and then literally on examining the knee, it was just wobbly. So you have you corrected the tibia. Yeah. Compensate for the lateral collateral ligament. Yeah, to some extent, I can say, and maybe because of that frame that was extended to the femur, and she was walking with it, it has tightened or something has happened. I don't know exactly, but the laxity has come down, and she's. Kind of okay with it. So the stress X-rays of the knee, stress we used to see if uh, what is the lateral ligament that's still opening or not. Sorry, I don't have this test on circle. Let me see. Because because the thing is, do you think just a simple uh, reconstruction of the lateral collateral ligament would have solved the problem? Because it's only lateral instability. Not only a lateral instability, because see this this how it looked. Yeah, that's the pre-op. So if you reconstruct the lateral, because I've got a couple of cases where uh, knee surgeons have done this, and once you reconstruct the lateral collateral, then uh, this is not a stress X-ray. It's just she's standing on a leg. Yeah. yeah, and do you have stress views post correction? Uh, can I make a comment, please? Since yeah, we do not after, after corrections, like here also she's standing. Can I I'm, come in regarding this? I'm very, uh, I'm very puzzled how uh, bony correction has uh, um, uh, compensated for the ligament instability. Yes, can I, can I, can I uh, explain this one? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, Shibu. Yeah. Just the thing is that. the question that was arise by professor heman sharma the lateral instability yes? yes the answer is here because he has done the osteotomy in the tibia and at the same time he has put the ilizar of apparatus in the femur and when he has applied the apparatus in the femur the lateral side he has compressed and in the tibia he has done the osteotomy to do dig the mechanical axis and or and at the galaxies of the knee joint and the tissues in the around the knee especially in the lateral side after applying the lizard of there was a addition and compression was done in the lateral side and then the medial side the tibia upper tibia he has done the osteotomy and that helps to correct the deformity and stability of the knee joint this is the principle that he has done no i understand the correction of the deformity but i i'm not i can see how the ligaments would be but about yeah this looking fine so yeah okay can can i ask something please so yes sir yeah, yeah actually I just, uh, yeah uh, yeah what i mean that yeah some surgeons are sorry. doing the pulling of the fibula head downward dot pelle is doing that yeah yeah this, so this is what Yeah, he says that by if we pull the fibula downward, that will tighten the lateral ligaments. That also helps in these cases. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, that you can do, but that is. Uh, uh, can I comment, please? Yeah, please. Yeah, dear yeah, doctor. Ah, uh, thank you. Just I wanna uh, see. If you look the, to the X-ray to the right of the screen, we see the head of fibula is much lower than that of the right. 
Uh, I don't know. I want to see the X-ray uh, the, to uh, locate the fibular head before the operation, before the ELISA. Can you please? Because I think because the presence of the prosthesis is preventing him from putting, putting the wire through the fibular head. So when he distracts, when he distracted the uh, the femur and tibia uh, component, he gave pull out of the. Uh, here I think they are at the same level from the joint line. And in the X-ray after the operation, the fibula on the right become the head of fibula become lower. I think in intentionally he did the same because if you want to prevent uh, the pulling of the a fibular head, you have to put a wire inside it. But during building the frame, I didn't saw the wire passing through, through the fibula to the tibia. So by giving distraction, he uh, accidentally giving pulling to the fibular head down, then he achieved the stability of the lateral tumor. This is, uh, I think, so. Could be. Well, I heard of the fibula. I just Simon. brought back alignment and she was walking with it. Maybe all that added to it. I don't know. I didn't do anything intentionally. I didn't pull the fibula intentionally. Yeah, but Shibu, yeah. Shibu, can I give an opinion? Yeah, please, what please. I think is, uh, what you did is right, I think. The problem, the thing is, if you look at the tibial process, I mean, the tibial component, it is, uh, the stem is uh, directed laterally. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So in effect, it's a virus deformity. So what you did is probably right, I think. Yeah, that is the that is the right approach. What yeah. the hell is stretching the lateral ligament? Yeah. And that is the the, the position of the tibial component because, is stretching and, the and If you just try to pull the fibula head downwards, the same problem is going to happen again. Yes. It is not going to reverse it. Even yeah. if you put it down, it is not going to reverse. The main issue is the medial mechanical axis deviation. As mentioned by Cherry. Now that needs the right treatment. I think it is undercorrected. Even now, it remains undercorrected. Actually, on the table, I tried correcting acutely, and yeah. this is the maximum I could get. That's yeah, the you reason. Do slowly also, no. You can do slowly yeah, also. Yeah. In this case, you must bring the mechanical axis to the Fujisawa point. Yeah. Agree. Fully agree. Well, you could if the Buddha and the Fujisawa point, so you would have the better results. Yeah, Doctor, you know, you want the, to say something? I, I wanted to say yeah. uh, first, uh, Doctor Shibu, it was a wonderfully done case, and uh, we'll be able to comment about how what went wrong in the previous surgery only by looking at the preoperative X-rays. Uh, I do not agree to the point that the lateral collateral structures have got injured during the surgery. It might be only chronically elongated because of the pre-existing virus, and the orthoplastic surgeon has probably not done a proper medial release and virus correction during the uh, implant uh, implantation of the TKR. That can be very well uh, analyzed uh, by the position of the tibial stem itself, as was pointed out. Tibial stem should be parallel to the fibular uh, axis. Yes. If it is parallel to the fibular axis, it is a properly placed stem. Here we see that the stem of the fibula, uh, tibial component is uh, at, to, uh, pointing towards the fibula, and the lateral collateral structures are elongated as it was previously done. Because, uh, an orthoplastic surgeon will be able to comment on this particular X-ray and they will be able to criticize what went wrong during the first surgery much better than uh, elizero surgeons. And obviously, you know, here the there problem is, as pointed out is only really mechanical access. And you know, there, is no point in, uh, there is no point in discussing that. Uh, yeah. Obviously. Now, yeah. the so mechanical access needs correction and you have done it wonderfully. But yeah. only uh, uh, shortcoming that we have is we are not able to operate at the Cora. We are able to operate at a lower level to be safe from the implant. In this case, I think the Cora is at the level of the, I mean, we draw the mechanical axis along that tibial stem. And yeah, the tip of the stem. Line. You can yeah. do the uh, posterior tree. I want tree. to, I want to ask. If you got it to the Fujisawa point, then the longevity of the TKR would be much better. Much better, yes. He I, might I go want for to, early revision. Yeah. I want to ask with Rajat because he is doing a lot of TKR. In each case, where there is a virus department, how you cut the section? Rajat. Yeah, actually, as, as Dr. Yunus pointed out, uh, the stem of the tibia is not put right because it's pointing to the fibula. So I think when the first surgery was done, 
then only there was a malalignment and later on it it uh, resulted into a virus which we all are seeing so uh, let's hurry up and we are uh, i think full uh, shamshul do we have any other case yes we have one more case by dr jj yeah yeah let's start with that yes No. We have Dr. Jijesh from Kajikode. Uh, he has a talk on uh, post-traumatic knee deformity in a child. How to approach case decision? So, good evening to all. Am I audible, sir? Yeah. Yeah. So, I am going to speak with post-traumatic knee deformity. How to approach? So this is the history, a seven-year-old boy presented with a uh, deformity, as you can see in the X-ray and in the clinical picture, the deformity of right power limbs, valgus, shortening and the flexion deformity. And there is a uh, decreased range of motion also. So happened following trauma and clinically it has got genome valgus and the flexion deformity, LLD and decreased range of motion. And these are his X-rays where you can see the valgus deformity with an embryo in situ and a flexion deformity. So this is what happened to the patient. That is, uh, he had a trauma and he had sustained type 3 epiphyseal injury following that he was operated with a plate. Then later got infected. Then infection was controlled. <coughs> uh, then uh, knee, knee becomes stiff and uh, he was undergone physio. So during that time, uh, the tibial, you can see the tibial uh, tuberculosis got fractured then resulted in this deformity. This is the history of this patient. Now, the problems of these patients are now, they still he has got a distal femoral valgus, procuratum or uh, flexion contracture of the knee and a LLD, or femur and tibial facial injury and the implant institute. These are his problems. So, how to treat this and how to approach this? Which deformity you have to correct first, whether the femoral deformity or the tibial deformity? So, anything you have to assess the deformity properly and this. You can see the full length lateral x ray, and uh, it, what is this uh, deformed? Whether it's a procurement deformity or it's a flexion contracture. So, how do you find that? So, you draw the anterior femoral and tibial line, measure the angle between the anterior femoral and anterior tibial line. Then, you draw the measure the PPTA, and here almost uh, the, the PPT and the angle is uh, flexion angle is almost same, only a four degree difference. That is a mainly of a procurement deformity, and remaining is the flexion. Uh, the stiff knee. Now, the assessment of the coronal plate deformity, this is a distal femoral valgus, you can see the MPTA is AT and LD. So the valgus is in the femur. Now, how to treat this case? We have a case like this, which deformity will correct first. And these are the things you always keep in mind. What are the treatment options here? Whether I am going to do acute correction or gradual correction? And what is the implant of choice? And is there any chance of recurrence of the difference? These are the things we have to keep in mind. So this is what I plan. Uh, first thing is the uh, mobilization of the end, then, then you do implant removal, then go for an MRI and assess the prices. Then I plan for a two-stage surgery and stage one tibial correction and stage root film. Why I did tibial correction first? Because the procuratum deformity can mask the valgus deformity of the femur. So if you uh, correct the femur deformity first, you may end up with an under correction. So I did procuratum deformity correction first, then followed by the femur correction. You can also consider eight flight once you, your deformity is corrected to further prevent the deformities. So these are the MRI after the implant removal. You can see the facial plate irregularity in the lateral femoral condyle as well as the tibial lateral condyle. So coming to the treatment. So uh, this is stage one, tibial procurement and deformity correction. This is the planning for that. So how do you plan a, a deformity like this? So first is draw the proximal axis then the distal axis and find the cora. And cora is at the proximal facial region. Then I make a frame where the hinge is anteriorly at the convex side. If you want a lengthening frame, you can transverse along the transverse. Basically, anyway, you can put how much you want the length. Then the plan the osteotomy at the cora. And here, we have followed the osteotomy rule number one. That is osteotomy and the AC is passed through the any of the cora. Real element occurs without translation. So here is a symbol, the osteotomy rule number one. So this is what done to the patient, applied the ring, and uh, the rate of detachment was calculated according to the law of equilateral triangle. 
And these are the uh, clinical pictures after the correction. As you can notice that, you see the clinical picture before correction and the after correction. So how much valgus has increased? So once we corrected the procurement and deformity, the, the, whatever the unmasked valgus deformity has came out. So the valgus deformity of this is more. So if you had uh, corrected the femur first, if they are under-corrected. So these are these full length X-ray before correction, mm -hmm. as you can see the after correction, the difference of the mechanical X. Now, come to the femur correction planning. So here, the femur deformity correction by mechanical axis plan. So first thing is the find out the LDFA and the MPT, where, what, where is the problem? And here it is the LDFA is, you can see the pre-op uh, before correction of the tibial deformity, the LDFA was 71 degree. And uh, after correction of the tibial deformity, the, now you see in the full text, the LDFA is 61 degree. So obviously it is increased. Now mechanical axis planning, you first, uh, first measure the LDFA, then draw the uh, distal uh, axis, then you draw the proximal axis. The, this is a mechanical axis planning. So the, find out the Cora, then make a frame according to the deformity. The hinge is at the medial side, at the convex side, with a gestra articular hinge. And the plan osteotomy at near to the Cora so that lesser amount of transition. So this is a, a frame application after the, and uh, you can see the acute day corrected to see whether it is everything right. And you can see that the translation has uh, occurred here and the deformity is corrected. And this is an osteotomy rule number. If the ACA is passed through the Cora, but the osteotomy does not pass through this point and the bone ends are at the osteotomy level will both angulate and translate each other. That's the osteotomy rule number two followed in the femur. Whereas in the TBI, it was osteotomy rule number one. And these are his uh, clinical uh, picture and the, uh, the X-rays where the deformity is corrected fully and the mechanical axis is corrected. And range of motion is almost near normal and his walking pattern is, you can see the gait. And you can see the child is uh, even removing this, uh, the nail and the pin from his uh, femur. The, the tips and tricks you should know in this proximal tibial illusoro. So make a pre-construct frame by pre-operative planning. And apply the first ring parallel to the joint line and hinge at the core and remaining ring parallel to the mechanical axis. And you can use three of three wire and one or two shans in the proximity end. And osteotomy site has to plan and follow the osteotomy rules. And you should also know about the extra articular, what is the extra articular hinge. Here, normally the hinge is between the first and second ring and here the proximal and distal ring. And uh, here the, the hinge has to be away from the uh, ring. That is uh, near to the joint. In the discussion about what you should know is that in gradual deformity can be done in larger deformity associated with the neurovascular or any other soft tissue such as at risk or born at risk and to minimize the injury to the periosteum. So, and you have to, any case, you have to follow the principle of deformity correction. That is, you should know the all the angles and normal alignment. Then you have to do the malalignment test and you have to find out whether it's a uniapical or multiapical deformity and you have to find out the Cora, and whether it's a single plane deformity, and if it is a multiple plane deformity, you'd find out this uh, oblique and deformity, then you have to follow the osteotomy. These are the things you have to follow any deformities, what are the implants you use. So the take home message in this case is in severe deformities, gradual correction is the best method. Always plan before you do any deformity correction and follow the osteotomy rules. And when there is a multiple deformities near a joint, there's a chance of masking one deformity to other. So you have to plan it very well before jumping the treatment. Do in a stage manner rather than doing in a single stage manner. And in complex deformities, of course, you can use a six axis system in this type of case. And it's all given in this book. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayesh. Any uh, questions? Shamsul, uh, do you get any questions? So, we have two questions from YouTube. May I ask, sir? Yes. Yeah. Yes. In the meantime, please, stop uh, sharing. Also, sir, there is a question. Also, sir, is there? Yeah, also, yeah. are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Yes, from Khaled El Qurani is asking a question that in the case of little boy presented with a stiff non union, Fracture femur with sclerotic bone managed by close correction with Elizero. 
My question is: Is the it is the same done every the fracture step nonunion with active discharging sinus? What is the indication for gradient of fracture site in step nonunion fracture related cases? Now, when there is a sinus, the body means body decides there is something I have to expel out. So I will always open such cases. That means the big circulation there, body want to take it out. To the debridement. Uh, yeah, yeah. This, this another question by Ahmed Akhil from the panel that in the femur, if there is no good bone for corticotomy, in distal facies, there is. Uh, then can we? Where can we make the corticotomy for to get length? Can we do corticotomy in proximal femur region? For lengthening. Yes, sir. For lengthening. When there is the no good bone for corticotomy. Yes. Pardon? When there is no good bone for corticotomy in distal facies. You know, lengthening in the femur, all over it is covered by muscle so Your lengthening you can do osteotomy anywhere. Right, Especially sir. in children. Any more comments from the panel? Bari, sir. Please unmute, sir. Uh, yes. Regarding what? Regarding the lengthening in the femur? Yes, sir. You can do in the proximal, middle, even the distal. Children, no problem. The full okay. bone is covered with the muscles. The core, when there's an angular deformity, then you have to be stick on to the cora or near to the cora based on yes. the first yes. order rule. Lengthening is yes. only no, along the axis. Yes. And the full femur is covered by muscles all over. And regarding the, I want to add one thing. What Haman Sharma told, uh, uh, 20, 25 to 30 degree angulation, you can correct <coughs> equately. And in Elizara procedure, you should have to go for gradually. Everything must be done gradually. This is the theory. <coughs> Everybody knows. There's a question from Dr. Yunus. Uh, I just wanted to ask the opinion of all the seniors here. Generally, we feel that uh, in femur, uh, or even in tibia for that matter, the quality of regenerate from a diaphyseal corticotomy is much better than a metaphyseal corticotomy. What is your opinion on uh, this uh, observation? Uh, uh, very good question. Very good question. And the questioner here is of an opinion that uh, diaphyseal corticotomy is the right thing to do. Uh, as pointed, uh, corticotomy can be done anywhere. Diaphysis, proximal metaphysis, distal metaphysis, anywhere. And I am asking you, what is the quality of regenerate in these places? Well, quality, the even then, metaphysial region is better always in case of tibia or in femur. No, I, can I, tell you, I can tell you, Yunus. Ah, yes, sir. Uh, when you do a metaphysial osteotomy, your fixation on the metaphysial part is poor. That is why you are getting poor regenerate. In a diaphysial osteotomy, you have the skills of stabilizing the, step, the, the segments well. That is hmm. why you are getting better bone formation. More uh, stable and, uh, but yeah. micro motions. <laughs> micro becomes macro. <laughs> True that. Yeah. I think, uh, I think diaphysis generally, my experience is that diaphysis is not as good in terms of the region rate, but the stability certainly matters. I think Vasu is absolutely right. We tend to go very high and compromise on the stability. And if you see your two ring proximal block seems to give you better regenerate than a single ring uh, 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 block. And when you do, you, you do, do, do a two ring block, you always tend to come down on the, um, on your, on your osteotomy. And uh, so I think it's just very individual and also related to individual patients as well. If you do iron lengthening nails, we always tend to do diaphysia. Very rarely we do metaphysial lengthening uh, osteotomies. And they seem to do e equally well. Uh, in fact, better in the femur, the proximal uh, uh, osteotomy lengthening seems to be more stable. <coughs> Very good results because I think it all comes down to stability and the strain value of your uh, of the of the regenerate or the or the osteotomy. Right. One more question, sir. Uh, Yaman, sir, in uh, knee valgus deformity while doing gradual correction, how often you do CPN release, sir? Is, is it, it for me or Vasu? Yes, sir. Uh, Yaman, sir. <laughs> no, sir. 
Yeah. So, so I, I think uh, if it's a distal femoral correction, I guess I, is I I I don't think we need to do the. Uh, 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 so distal femoral correction, I think up to twenty degrees, twenty twenty five degrees, you can easily do it. Yeah, okay. easy. And the tip you got to be a lot more. Yeah. And in the tibia, it is different. Yes, it's, it's very different in the proximal tibia. Where you are saying that 170 degrees of genuval, the femur valgus, character without release in the peroneal nerve. Right. But so you are I, prepared yeah. to go in, in, in the middle of, even if the elevator of surgery, when you're doing it gradually, you will find the nerve can be stre stretched. So you should be prepared to, in the middle of surgery, to actually go and release the nerve. And yeah. that we all have done a number of times in our practice. Yeah. Anything more than that, the tibial procurvatum de uh, deformity, the proximal tibial procurvatum deformity, they tend to have more of a CPN palsy. When you correct the procurvatum into extension and virus. Okay, uh, Shamsul, any more questions? Uh, any more questions on the panel? Uh, we don't have it, sir. Okay, I think it's already two and a half hours. One of the great discussions and a very important topic by two stalwarts of deformity correction. And I thank you once again, Professor Heyman and Dr. Vasudevan for uh, taking their precious time and teaching all of us, showing wonderful cases. And uh, thank you, everyone. And stay tuned. Next month, again, first Friday, 8 p.m., we'll be coming with another exciting theme and other renowned faculties. So I thank you all for coming and having a great discussion. And yeah, Dr. Cherian, one last question. Yeah, please. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, you want to say something? Good night. <laughs> oh, okay, good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs> thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thank you very, Bye. very much. Good night, sir. Good night. Good night. Mangal. Good night, sir. Mangal was there. I saw him. He never. Yeah, he had disappeared. <laughs> <laughs>